Welcome to this educational program. This module describes the causes and effects, or pathophysiology, of a condition called rhinosinusitis. There are other modules available that describe the sinuses and other aspects of rhinosinusitis. Please feel free to view this presentation as many times as necessary. You may also use the player on your left to repeat slides or to skip through them in any order you wish. Some slides in this presentation show detailed illustrations, and you may wish to pause the presentation at times to take them all in. The paranasal sinuses, or sinuses for short, are the four pairs of mucus-lined hollow spaces inside the bones of the face and skull. They are located on either side of the nose, the maxillary sinuses, in between the eyes, the ethmoid sinuses, behind the eyes, the sphenoid sinuses, and in the forehead, the frontal sinuses. Though their exact function is unknown, it is thought that the sinuses help to warm, humidify, and filter inhaled air, regulate pressure within the nose, contribute to immune defense, lighten the weight of the skull, give resonance to the voice, absorb shock from blows to the face, and contribute to facial growth. By producing half a liter to a liter of mucus each day, which empties into the nasal cavity, the sinuses contribute greatly to air filtration. Tiny hairs called cilia propel the mucus into the canals, or meadi, of the nasal cavity through tiny openings called ostea. The anterior, or front, ethmoid sinuses, the frontal sinuses, and the maxillary sinuses all empty their mucus into the middle meatus, creating a congested area called the osteomeatal complex. The posterior, or back, ethmoid sinuses, and the sphenoid sinuses empty mucus into the superior meatus. Regular clearance of mucus into the nasal cavity keeps the sinuses hollow and sterile. This clearance depends on healthy cilia, thin fluid mucus, and unobstructed ostea. A change in any of these factors, therefore, could hinder normal mucus clearance and lead to sinus inflammation and infection. The inflammation or swelling of one or more sinuses is called rhinosinusitis. Originally called just sinusitis, the term now includes the Greek word rhino, meaning nose, as we have since learned that the sinuses and nose are most often inflamed together due to one continuous mucus lining. Forms of rhinosinusitis range from mild to severe and can be significantly uncomfortable, causing tenderness in the face, aching behind the eyes, pain, fever, and difficulty breathing through the nose. Rhinosinusitis can be caused by anything that impedes airflow into the sinuses and or mucus clearance out of the sinuses. This can be brought on by infection, allergy, irritants, anatomical obstruction, foreign bodies, disease, dryness, and certain medications. Insufficient air circulation and buildup of mucus in the sinuses can cause pressure and pain and create formidable conditions for bacteria and fungi or mold to grow. As these microorganisms flourish inside the sinuses, the body's immune system responds by creating even more mucus. The swelling, infection, and increased mucus secretion in the sinuses all obstruct the sinus openings, or ostea, which further propagates mucus buildup, reduced air circulation, and infection. This cycle of mucus buildup, decreased airflow, pain and swelling, infection, and further mucus buildup continues and this can lead to chronic or long-term rhinosinusitis if left untreated. The osteomeatal complex is like the grand central station of the sinuses, providing for mucociliary clearance and ventilation of three out of four sinuses. It is particularly vulnerable to inflammation, as even relatively minor swelling in this area can lead to frontal, ethmoid, or maxillary rhinosinusitis. Rhinosinusitis often follows respiratory tract infections caused by viruses, such as the common cold or flu. Though a viral infection doesn't directly cause symptoms, it does inflame the sinuses. In response to infection, our immune system sends white blood cells, or pus cells, and mucus to the lining of the nose, causing the nasal passages to swell. Since the lining of the nasal passages is continuous with the lining of the sinuses, the sinus cavities also swell and start to close off the ostea. 
As a result, mucus becomes trapped behind the sinuses, and mucus and airflow slows or ceases. The moist, stagnant mucus allows for bacteria and fungi to grow, leading to another or secondary infection. In addition to viruses, potentially infectious bacteria harbored in other parts of the body can also invade the sinuses. Normal healthy sinuses do not contain any pathogenic or disease-causing microorganisms, but when the functioning of their mucus or cilia is abnormal, pathogenic bacteria from the throat can invade. Bacterial dental infections can also spread to the sinuses because of the close proximity of the maxillary sinuses to the teeth. Dental infections, in fact, actually account for about 10% of maxillary rhinosinusitis cases. There is also an association between rhinosinusitis and allergic rhinitis, a condition commonly known as hay fever or nasal allergies. Allergic reaction, the body's strong response to something in the environment, can lead to rhinosinusitis, since the immune system responds to allergens or allergy triggers as it responds to infection, sending mucus to the lining of the nose, causing the nasal and sinus passages to swell. Again, the ostea can close up and infection may occur. Many irritants can also cause sinuses to swell and can sometimes paralyze the cilia. These include air pollution, tobacco smoke, car exhaust, gasoline fumes, paint fumes, perfume, household chemicals, and pesticides to name a few. In addition, anatomical obstruction from a deviated septum, nasal polyp, or nasal tumor can predispose to rhinosinusitis. A deviated septum is a crooked wall between the nostrils, and in some individuals it can obstruct the ostea. Sometimes, the obstruction can cause enough swelling of the nasal cavity's mucus lining that it forms fluid-filled sacs called polyps. Polyps, as well as nasal tumors, can also block the ostea. Tumors may be benign or non-cancerous, or malignant, meaning cancerous. A deviated septum can be repaired, and nasal polyps and tumors can be surgically removed. In hospitalized patients, foreign bodies such as nasal endotracheal tubes and nasogastric tubes have also been implicated as predisposing factors for rhinosinusitis. The tubes are inserted into the nose or mouth to assist with breathing, feeding, or draining the stomach. They can irritate the nasal mucus lining, causing swelling and obstruction of the ostea. They can damage the ostea directly, they can introduce pathogenic bacteria upon their insertion, and they can accumulate a bacterial biofilm, a slimy coating, when left in place. Finally, disease, dryness, and medications can predispose an individual to rhinosinusitis. Cystic fibrosis is a genetic disease that causes the body to produce excessively thick, sticky mucus that clogs the respiratory tract and impairs breathing. In Cartagener syndrome, defective cilia are unable to clear the airways of mucus and bacteria, resulting in mucus buildup and chronic or recurrent infection. Conditions such as asthma, narrowed air passages in the lungs, chronic tonsillitis, infection of the tonsils on either side of the throat, and adenoidal hypertrophy, the swelling of the organs above the tonsils, may also lead to rhinosinusitis. Dryness can also impair cilia movement and mucus flow and is sometimes brought on by medications such as antihistamines. The symptoms associated with rhinosinusitis are divided into major and minor groups. Major symptoms include facial pain, pressure and fullness, nasal congestion, nasal discharge, a diminished or lost sense of smell, and sometimes fever. Minor symptoms include headache, halitosis or bad breath, fatigue, tooth pain, cough, and ear pain, pressure, and fullness. What determines a diagnosis of rhinosinusitis is a specific combination of these symptoms. For example, a patient likely has rhinosinusitis if he or she has two or more major symptoms, one major symptom and two or more minor symptoms, or just nasal purulence, or pus. Rhinosinusitis may be acute, meaning sudden and short, chronic, meaning long-term, or recurrent, meaning repeated. Acute rhinosinusitis 
is the temporary inflammation of the sinuses from seasonal or animal dander allergy or from infection due to pathogens such as bacteria or viruses. It typically has a rapid onset, lasts four weeks or less, and its symptoms completely resolve. Most cases of acute rhinosinusitis are due to viral infection. Chronic rhinosinusitis, on the other hand, is the prolonged inflammation and impairment of the sinuses. It is often brought on by allergy, anatomical obstruction, and conditions such as asthma, cystic fibrosis, or immunodeficiency, the decreased ability of the body to fight infection and disease. Its symptoms persist longer than 12 weeks and can be difficult to treat. The division of rhinosinusitis into acute and chronic types is a bit of an artificial classification created by physicians. In reality, untreated acute rhinosinusitis may actually become chronic rhinosinusitis. They are often a continuous disease. Most patients recover from acute rhinosinusitis within three weeks. For some patients, however, the problem remains unresolved and the mucous lining of the sinuses undergoes changes that prolong inflammation and infection. The sinuses are normally sterile and any temporary contamination gets swept away by cilia. In chronic rhinosinusitis, however, the cells containing cilia are replaced by flat, scaly cells. Without mucociliary clearance, the normally sterile environment is lost. In addition, many different types of inflammatory cells released by the body's immune system rush to the sinuses and replicate rapidly, and sinus cells, called goblet cells, produce a more viscous or thicker mucus. As a result, the chronically inflamed sinus mucus lining continues to block the ostea, interferes with mucociliary clearance, and promotes bacterial overgrowth. Recurrent rhinosinusitis occurs as several separate incidences in one year, often triggered by seasonal allergy and allergy to animal hair, dust, mites, and mold. When rhinosinusitis is managed properly, complications rarely occur. However, in some circumstances, it may spread and cause life-threatening conditions. Rhinosinusitis can spread to the facial bones or to the membranes that protect the brain, causing brain damage. It can spread to the eye socket and cause reduced vision or even blindness. And it can spread to neighboring veins, sometimes causing aneurysms or weakness in the blood vessels or blood clots. Rhinosinusitis may also increase the symptoms of asthma and other chronic lung diseases. To summarize, the health of the sinuses depends on sufficient ventilation and the normal clearance of mucus from the sinus cavities into the nasal cavity. Anything impeding air and mucus flow, therefore, can cause a cycle of mucus buildup, inflammation, microbacterial infection, and further mucus buildup. Factors such as infection, allergy, irritants, obstruction, foreign bodies, disease, and dryness can all lead to this inflammation of the sinuses, called rhinosinusitis. Symptoms of rhinosinusitis include facial pain and pressure, nasal congestion and discharge, headache, fever, bad breath, cough, tooth and ear pain, and diminished sense of smell. Rhinosinusitis may be acute, chronic, or recurrent, and may rarely spread, sometimes causing serious disease. Other modules in this series include Understanding Rhinosinusitis, What are the Sinuses, and The Management and Treatment of Rhinosinusitis. Here are just a few of many resources available to educate you on rhinosinusitis. These resources may also assist you. We sincerely hope that this module has furthered your understanding of the causes and effects of rhinosinusitis. We wish you the best for the future and thank you once again for viewing this educational program.